Good morning. Oh, let's see. Oh, should I? Good morning. Is that? Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> So I'm uh, Dr. Gretchen Crary, I'm one of the pathologists at Hennepin County Medical Center, just down the road a piece. But many moons ago I was right here at the University of Minnesota where I did my residency, medical school and residency here. Um, and I've been practicing for over 20 years, most of the time in Hennepin County Medical Center. And one of my um, areas of interest, my main area of interest is renal pathology. And so we've had a, a residence rotate through on our rotation and it's been a real pleasure to have Miro come through and with his interest in renal path and we started this project on something that I'm very interested in which is uh, kidney biopsy adequacy which over the years has had its um, changes of who does the biopsy and how they um, collect the specimens and um, as we all know it's very frustrating when you don't get enough tissue to make a diagnosis and so I've done a lot of teaching of radiologists and nephrologists on how to obtain good biopsies over my 20 plus years of practice and now Miro and I have done this project, which he will discuss. All right, let's see. Let's start. You guys can hear me? Except for Jackie. Yeah. So as Dr. Cree indicated, <clears throat> the project that we worked on was regarding, you know, what makes a good kidney biopsy. And we're talking about medical kidney biopsies, not neoplastic biopsies. I have nothing to disclose. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to start off by talking about this project, and maybe if we have time, we'll talk about other academic endeavors I'm involved in and other topics I'd like to look into later on down the road. So I've uh, given this talk, or partially given this talk, to uh, other places, and so I started the talk by asking, how do they do renal biopsies at, at that institution? Here at the U, I have some understanding that uh, sometimes nephrologists are doing the biopsies, and they look at them themselves. As they take the biopsy, they look quickly to see, do I have gloms or not? They send it off to pathology. It's, other instances, we have recently uh, had our pathology assist assistants come up to the plate and have to do adequacy, which I know they enjoy that very much, and uh, they, they help out the radiology team here at the U. Um, so moving along, I'm not going to get, I'm just going to give a brief introduction. You have two kidneys in the retroperitoneal space. They're involved with filtration, elaboration of hormones, and other fun things. The most important thing is that native kidneys are located in the retroperitoneum, and uh, they're relatively easy to access. If we look at a cross-section of the kidney, uh, it has a cortex and medulla. Why do I point that out? Well, when they take renal biopsies, you're really trying to get a wee bit more of the cortex as opposed to medulla. The reason being is that the cortex contains glomeruli in addition to tubules, interstitium, vasculature, while the, cortex, well, the medulla does not contain uh, glomeruli. And often, uh, renal pathologies are glomerulocentric, so you want to collect glomeruli. So that's why we try to get mostly cortex if possible. <clears throat> the tools that are used are, for instance, these kind of biopsy guns. They can see here the numbers of different models and gauges. <coughs> Typically, 16 gauge or 18 gauge are used. Um, if they use ultrasound guidance, they're trying to shoot for the edge. They're not, not trying to shoot for the center or hypoechoic areas where uh, there's more vessels, obviously. They don't want a bleeder. So when they do the biopsy, uh, they take the biopsy, put it off to the side sometimes, and they look under a dissected microscope. In some institutions, they use light microscope, and they kind of look to see if they're glomeruli. So how do glomeruli look? Well, if you're lucky, glomeruli look like this. You have these little bowls or tufts of, of small vessels. Those are your gloms. Sometimes they're avascular, so you're just looking for little uh, opaque bumps. Um, and of course, if you get this, this is medulla, and really all you're seeing here is the medullary rays of vasculature, and you're not really seeing glomeruli. So if you see this, you're going to ask for more tissue because you're not going to get anywhere with this piece of tissue. So why do I worry so much? Why is it so important to get good tissue? Well, it's kind of common sense, but I mean, uh, a proper sampling, a kidney gives you insight as to what's going on uh, patho patho uh, in terms of any underlying histopathologic process. Um, an old, old study back in 48 showed that uh, you don't need a biopsy bilateral, bilaterally. If you just sample one of the kidneys, it's representative of both kidneys. So, so what factors could affect uh, the yield of a, of a kidney biopsy? Well, it depends on the performer of the biopsy, an experience, or just what sort of specialty they're in. Um, the gauge of needle used, as I mentioned, typically we see 16 or 18 gauge needles. Uh, which imaging modality is used for guidance. In some places, they don't use imaging gu image guidance. Uh, when I was over in uh, Norway recently, they were talking about how 
uh, like in Eastern Europe, they're a gas to help. In some place in Eastern Europe, they're just doing the old-fashioned kind of just feel out and go in and try to take the biopsy without the use of ultrasound even. And, you know, we talk here in the States, ultrasound super cheap and easy, but in some places they don't even have ultrasound. So, But in the States, we usually have ultrasound guidance and or even CT guidance. Um, whether or not on-site evaluation of adequacy used. Uh, I described how you throw the tissue underneath the dissecting scope or light microscope and you try to see if they're glomeruli or not. Some, instances, put some places, as I'll present, they don't even do that. They just take the biopsy and they toss it in the solution, the fixative, and they send it off to pathology. Uh, the state of the kidney parenchyma. You can imagine that if the kidney parenchyma is a little bit fibrotic or edematous, maybe the, your yield or your collection of, of glomeruli or tissue would be maybe different. Um, the amount of tissue you're collecting would influence the yield, and I'm sure there's other factors I can't think of. So, uh, perform, so uh, looking into the literature, there's actually not a lot on this topic in terms of, of what makes a good biopsy, uh, what makes a good kidney biopsy. In this one study, they compared nephrologists and radiologists, and they showed that the nephrologists captured more glomeruli, and there was no difference in procedure complications. Uh, in this study, they did actually whip out uh, a cohort of patients that they had biopsy with 14 gauge needles and they showed there was no difference uh, in using a 14 or 16 gauge needle, but they did show a higher rate of hematomas with the 14 gauge, probably one of the reasons why they don't use 14 gauges in general. Um, comparing 16 and 18 gauge needles, um, they showed that with a 16 gauge needle, you increased your sensitivity for detecting or for attaining adequate transplant biopsies and there was a greater rate of hematomas, but in another study they showed that there was no difference in, in, in complications. So there's variable data in terms of complications and gauge of needle. And then only one prior study or looked into the use of, uh, or the utility or the benefit of using on-site evaluation. In this study, they had a mixture of dissecting scope or light microscope uh, use for looking at adequacy, and they showed that uh, when it was used, there was more glomeruli capture as opposed to if you did not use on site evaluation. And in this study, in these two studies, they just simply showed that if you have one core versus two cores, uh, the more tissue you get, uh, you're going to be more, you'll be, the sensitivity rate for detecting rejection and transplant kidneys would be greater. So how do we define adequate? For transplant biopsies back in 97, there's a, BAM, there's a BAMF criteria for how you define what is a, a, an adequate renal biopsy. And so you can see that for an adequate biopsy, you want 10 or more gloms or 10 or more arteries. An inadequate biopsy would be less than seven gloms and no arteries. But for native kidneys biopsies, we don't really have a defined criteria. I mean, it's kind of common sense. Sometimes you get lucky, you get one glom that tells you the answer. In other instances, you need to have more of a sampling to get to the answer. <clears throat> so if we're going to look at what makes a biopsy adequate, maybe we should lay out some parameters to study. So we could count the number of glomerular arteries. We could look at the rate of adequacy or inadequacy for transplant cases. And we can even maybe more practically look at the rate of the inability to give a diagnosis even. So this data has been preliminarily presented in a conference in, in Germany. Just I guess I should preface that. And, uh, the data has not really changed from that point on, but we've doubled the N. Um, so the objective, uh, like Dr. Cree said, over time, I guess we sort of noticed uh, that there was variability in terms of the, the, the quality of tissue we were receiving from different practitioners, and we wanted to look at it objectively, not just saying, hey, Hospital X keeps sending us this kind of crappy tissue. We wanted to like objectively look at it and say, hey, these practitioners are doing it this way. Maybe it could be improved. So we're looking at uh, different practitioners of who, uh, who are performing the biopsies. We're going to look at... Um, you know, what image of modality is being used, engage of needles, and we're also going to look at um, if on-site evaluation is being used even um, compared to those people who are, who are performing that job. So we retrospectively looked at 636 kidney biopsies um, that are seen at Hennepin County. Uh, those are not all the last 636. Uh, to do the study, I want to know uh, who did the biopsy, if they used on-site evaluation, if they did, who did the on-site evaluation, which image guidance was used, and what gauge needle was used. So if I didn't have that, those, those details, those cases are not included in here. Um, medical, uh, Hennepin County is an interesting site because uh, it's a referral center, so we really do see a mix of practice scenarios in terms of, of what kind of biopsies and how the biopsies are being taken. So it's a really great opportunity to, to do the study in that setting. Um, the kidney biopsies were done with 16 or 18 gauge needles. The imaging modalities that were used were ultrasound and CT. 
And if on-site evaluation was performed uh, for adequacy, a dissected microscope is used, so that's 20x. So we have a total of 636 patients, the median age about 57 years old. Uh, again, what's interesting about the Hennepin population is that uh, as opposed to a lot of academic centers, including our own here at the U, uh, they have 80% native kidney biopsies, or 80% essentially new diagnoses, as opposed to flipping that around where often at the U you have 80% transplant biopsies. So it makes for a very different patient population. So as trainees, when you rotate a Hennepin, you really get a wide swath. And this here is just a table showing the different diagnoses that I saw in those 636 cases, really a whole swath of, of kind of diagnoses you can learn, you see when you're there. So to start off, I'm going to examine the performance of the people who are actually doing the biopsy. So we can break it down into um, two groups. Either they're using on-site evaluation or they're not using on-site evaluation. We have nephrologists using ultrasound, 18-gauge needles. We have radiologists using ultrasound or CT. And then we have these guys here who are, who are again, using 18-gauge needles or 16-gauge needles, again, with ultrasound and not using on-site evaluation. So if we just throw off by comparing the groups that I just showed you in maroon, we have the folks who are using on-site evaluation. In orange, we have the folks who are not using on-site evaluation. And this is just total glomerulized. So if we compare this group over here, these are the radiologists not using on-site evaluation, but using a wider bore needle, 16-gauge needle, they're capturing more glomeruli than the rest of the groups. If we compare this group of radiologists not using on-site evaluation and using a typical 18-gauge needle, they get far less gloms than everyone else. And when we compare the nephrologists to the radiologists that are using on-site evaluation, they are getting less gloms or providing us less gloms in total per case. Uh, what's interesting to point out here is that the radiologists, so one comparison we can make first off is that does on-site evaluation help? Well, we can compare these two groups, the radiologists using ultrasound and 18-gauge needles, and this is a group that does not use on-site evaluation, and this group does use on-site evaluation. So you can see that there's probably some benefit by using on-site evaluation. And we will also count our arteries and see how many arteries are collected per case. And again, this group down here that's not using on-site evaluation and an 18-gauge needle, they're not collecting as many arteries per case. The nephrologists are collecting less arteries than the radiologists using CT and radiology using ultrasound. And the radiologists, this is another nice point of comparison. I'll go back to the other side, slide. Comparing the use of ultrasound versus CT guidance, and these are comparable because they're both using on-site evaluation, they're both using 18-gauge needles. Uh, the CT guided biopsies are getting more arteries. And if I go back to the prior slide, I can show you actually there's no difference in the gloms collected between ultrasound and CT. So it doesn't seem that individual modality in the hands of radiologists is really making a difference. So was that a fair way to evaluate performance of the people doing these biopsies? And shouldn't we normalize the data somehow? Because often when you do science, right, you don't just want to just look at sheer numbers. You want to normalize the data some fashion. And what do you do if one group collects more tissue than the other? So to answer the first question, well, honestly, as a pathologist, I care about the number of gloms I have in my slide. Because if I have more gloms, total gloms, I can provide an answer. If I have a total glom, total glom of one, it will be harder for me to make an answer. But again, we should normalize data. We should take into account if some group is collecting more tissue. So that's what I looked at next. So I compared the amount of tissue collected per group. And what I can tell you is that this group of radiologists who have, uh, don't use on-site evaluation, use 18-gauge needles, are collecting less tissue than the rest of the groups. And this group over here, they are collecting uh, more tissue than the radiologists using ultrasound and the nephrologists using ultrasound. And the nephrologists, again, they're collecting less, oh, we'll get into that later, but the nephrologists are collecting less tissue compared to the radiologists. So then with that data in mind, we have the length of the tissue, we have the total number of gloms, we can talk about density of glomeruli. And not the acute with numbers, but density of glomeruli essentially equates to how much cortex you're getting, right? Because you have more glomeruli in the cortex, you don't have glomeruli in the doll. So, so what we see here, we see that these guys here are not only providing less tissue, and they're not just providing us less glomeruli, but they're also providing us, if you want to say, less quality tissue, but they're providing us less cortex. If we look at the density of arteries provided per biopsy, again, this group here, they're not just providing less gloms or, or less arteries, they're also providing us less quality tissue. So conclusions from this just few 
bits of data I've shown you, the radiologists are using ultrasound guidance with 18 gauge needles without on-site evaluation is providing poor tissue compared to all the other groups. And I also point out that the use of on-site evaluation can improve the yield or there's a better yield of glomerular and glomerular density when they use um, uh, on-site evaluation. Remember I showed you those radiologists using 18 gauge needles and ultrasound. There was a better yield of glomeruli when they used on-site evaluation. And it seemed that group on the far end that used a 16 gauge needle, even though they were not using on-site evaluation, they actually were collecting, uh, if they collected extra tissue, they actually provided adequate tissue. So you can make up for not having on-site evaluation by using a waterborne needle and possibly collecting more tissue. Um, the nephrologists were collecting less tissue, but the density or the quality was fine. And there was no difference between the, the biopsies performed under ultrasound or CT guidance, except for the total arteries. But the gloms and the glom glomerular density were the same. Any questions? All right, so moving on. Next, I want to compare the, perform the, the folks who are performing the on-site evaluation. So in some instances, the nephrologist would do the biopsy, and they would, look, uh, they would just turn around the table, and they would uh, determine on a dissecting scope themselves whether or not their biopsy was adequate or not. In other instances, you would have a radiologist doing a biopsy. They'd hand it off to a pathologist of some sort, and they would determine if it was adequate or not. So there's different pairings. There's different mat mixed matching of folks and roles. So again, I broke it down into the groups that are performing on-site evaluation. And again, this is the same group that I showed already before. This is not using on-site evaluation. We broke it down into general pathologists, renal pathologists, and nephro nephrologists. Uh, the definition of renal pathologist would be a pathologist who signs out renal pathology. <coughs> so, um, so we looked again at, so here, the, the colors, the bars in maroon are the folks who are, who are doing on-site evaluation, and the groups in orange are not using on-site evaluation. And all of these groups, they, these are all 18-gauge needles. So the only group that's using a 16-gauge needle is this group down far end that I already represented before, or presented to you before. And what we can see again, this group down here that's not using on-site evaluation but a waterborne needle is collecting more gloms per case. And this group here, again, not using on-site evaluation but using the 18-gauge needle, is collecting less gloms per case. And the nephrologists, again, when they're doing on-site evaluation, they're also providing less glomeruli per case um, compared to the pathologist. It's worth pointing out here that the pathologist, it doesn't seem to matter whether you're a general pathologist or a renal pathologist, they're still providing the same number of gloms. So it doesn't mean matter if you're signing up renal pathology every day, you, you just need to teach someone what a glom is on a dissecting scope and they can do the job. Uh, total arteries per case. Uh, again, this group down here that's not using on-site evaluation, any 10 gauge needle, they're providing less arteries per case. Uh, the nephrologists are providing less arteries per case compared to old groups except for this one down here. And in this instance, the renal pathologists uh, uh, collect, would collect more arteries than the general pathologists, if that matters. So again, I approach the same question that I approached before with the performance of the biopsy. Is it a fair way to compare groups just by sheer numbers or should I normalize it based on the amount of tissue provided? And so that's what I did. We looked at the total amount of tissue from the angle of who's performing on-site evaluation. Uh, and we could say that the nephrologists, again, are when, where they are either doing the biopsy themselves or they're uh, pr you know, performing on-site evaluation, they're collecting less tissue. The tissue that they're dealing with is less. And we can say also that this group down here is also collecting less tissue than most mm -hmm. other groups. So then we look at density of gloms from the angle of the performer's on-site evaluation. We can say that, again, this group here, these cowboys, they're just, you know, they, they're not doing on-site evaluation. They're using the same gauge needle. They're not providing enough tissue. They've got, you know, wimpier tissue in the end. Um, and then this group down here is, is doing on-site evaluation. They're getting a few more uh, glomeruli per glomerular density than the nephrologists. Oops, that's And arterial <coughs> density. Again, this group down here is performing worse than the rest that we've seen over and over and over again. And the renal pathologists are edging out the, this group down here by a wee bit uh, for density of arteries. So conclusions, again, that same group that I showed you down there that's not using on-site evaluation with an 18-gauge needle, um, they are just providing uh, you know, poor tissue. Um, and again, I showed also that group down the far end that's using a 16 gauge needle, a wider bore needle than all the other groups. They're able to, when they collect more tissue, actually generally provide comparable tissue yield as to the other groups, except for the fact that the renal pathologists were collecting more arteries. 
uh, once again, the nephrologists are collecting less tissue, so it doesn't seem to matter whether they're doing a biopsy or providing adequacy assessment. Um, you know, in the end, when they're involved, the tissue is less. Uh, the, when we're comparing general pathologists and renal pathologists, there didn't seem to be a difference in the yield of the glomeruli or arteries for the most part. Um, so, moving on, any questions at that point? Yeah? When you, when you do your glomerular counts, you're counting both globally? Sclerotic yeah, sclerotic yeah, sclerotic. yeah, yeah, all glomerulus. Yeah. All right, so moving on, this seems like a very basic, simple question to answer. Is if, if I increase the amount of tissue, the length of the cores I'm collecting, will I get more, uh, will my biopsy yield, will the quality of my biopsy be better? So biopsy yield would be determined by total gloms, density gloms, arteries, or density of arteries. And as common sense would assume, yes, as you increase the amount of cores, the length of the cores you're collecting, you're going to get more gloms. And it's a significant uh, uh, relationship, linear relationship between these two variables. <laughs> What's kind of interesting, we'll touch upon in a second, uh, as you collect more tissue, though, the density of your glomeruli goes down. And going to arteries, as you collect more tissue, you're going to collect more arteries. But as you collect more tissue, the density of arteries you're collecting goes down. So yes, it makes sense. As you collect more tissue, you're going to get more total gloms and arteries. But why is it that as you collect more tissue, the density is going down? It seems like, obviously, as you keep going, you're probably collecting less cortex. I don't really know the biopsy procedure. Maybe as they keep going, they actually delve deeper into the tissue, and they're actually delving into cortex as opposed to actually more. They're delving into medulla as, as opposed to more cortex. So then I thought, well, how about uh, comparing clinical parameters, different other parameters to see if there's an association with the biopsy yield. And again, we'll look at age, serum creatinine, serum albumin, and, and urine protein and creatinine ratio. And what I could tell you is that when we look at total glomeruli, there is a linear or significant relationship between increasing albumin and the total amount of glomeruli capture. And when we look at glomerular density, again, I can tell you that as we have increasing, or in a sense, improving albumin, serum albumin, we're having uh, decreased density of glomeruli capture, and this is an interesting bit of data here. While the difference is not uh, great, there is a significant linear relationship between age and density of glomeruli capture. When it comes to the arteries, these parameters that we looked at didn't have any significant association or relationship. So uh, just to recapitulate, serum, as serum albumin increases, one can predict less total gloms collected. As age and serum albumin uh, increase, one can predict less glom density. So I cannot put together any rationale as to why your albumin, as your albumin increases, you'll be collecting more gloms. I mean, physiologically, I'm not quite sure. Any ideas, anyone? Love to hear some ideas. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think you can make an argument that, so if I understand it correctly, you're looking at the serum albumin. Yes. So as the serum albumin, uh, I mean, you can make an argument that as serum albumin decreases, that is to say, as, as the chronic disease. No, this is, in, this is increasing albumin. So as the albumin increases, the density of gloms goes down. Right. No, I mean, uh, oh. So what, what you, could, you could make the argument that the patients who have a diminishing serum albumin have chronic renal disease. Right, or, right, right. And as you lose tubules, you get, you, you know, and if you're counting obsolescent glomeruli, then as you lose tubule mass, you're going to have a higher density of glomeruli per, per millimeter of pore. You follow? So the tubules atrophy, the glomeruli, mm -hmm. if you, 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 you you still see them, but as the tubules atrophy, atrophy and, the, and the cortex shrinks, you're going to have a higher density of residual you know, obsolescent in your life. So I think it makes perfect sense. All right. All right. Same. I don't understand. Uh, Age? Creatinine, really doesn't, oh. show the same creatinine doesn't change. No, that's why the disconnect didn't really help me in making a rationale, honestly. So. Just uh, yeah. looking at that lower left, I mean, it looks like the, the right two points. The right two, no, the prior one. Which? There? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, the, the right two points are over eight, I think. Sorry? Are they yeah. not really skewing the line? I mean, no, I knocked those out for my own sake just to see if it changed the data. No, it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know whether I make a big deal about the relationship between albumin and uh, ground density or whatever it is. Yeah. Because, you know, if you look at the distribution, that it basically looks like a ball in the middle. Yeah. And to apply, you know, linear regression or some kind of linear correlation uh, to that kind of data, really, even if you have something that is statistically significant, it probably relates to the sample size, which is the like few hundreds that you have. Yeah. That's making it statistically significant. I think on an individual basis, it will have no 
Well, right. There is no great difference. As you go along the scale, there's no great difference. And that's, that's obvious from the graph, and I'm not trying to sell that there's a huge... But, but the, the relationship between those variables is significant. That's all I'm saying. I just think it's significant. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but that means implies that the, the relationship between those two variables is, is there. But you're right. The difference is you're creating or not creating. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Brennan. And then... The other thing is, so I, so I mentioned briefly about that. So with age, the kidney can become more fibrotic, possibly you know, altering the density of GLOMs. Um, or we're attaining more tissue in older patients. So this is approaching the age question. So remember, there was no, different, there was no relationship seen between total GLOMs and age. Um, so it's, and then the question is, is, are we collecting more tissue in these older patients, so as patients get older? And if we are, maybe it's non-cortical, and yes, actually it seems, again, as you were pointing out, Barak, that, that, the, that while the points on either end are not, you know, the slope is not great, the linear relationship's there, and it seems like for whatever reason, older, as the patients get older, we're collecting more tissue. So that would answer why we would have, and that tissue is less cortical tissue. Again, I don't know why we're collecting less cortical tissue in older patients. So, okay, so moving on, approaching the question of uh, what about the cases of insufficient tissue collected? So some diagnosis, all you provide is insufficient tissue to render a diagnosis. So maybe that's a more practical point to look at than playing number games and counting gloms and counting glom density and getting cutesy with the numbers. Maybe we should just say, well, who's providing us the uh, tissue that we can actually just make a diagnosis? So again, we had 636 total cases. 615, which we could give a diagnosis, 21 in which there was insufficient tissue that came around 3% of cases where we were unable to give a diagnosis. And again, while the N is not great, I can tell you that, and again, so this is just looking at the biopsy performance of the folks who are doing the biopsies, so in the instances where they're using on-site evaluation or not using on-site evaluation, um, we have here the number of insufficient diagnoses per performer of the biopsy and the rate. And I can tell you that, again, this group here, the radiologists who are uh, using ultrasound, not using on-site evaluation, and using an 18-gauge needle have a higher rate of insufficient diagnosis compared to all the other groups. So that wouldn't surprise you looking at the data I already previously showed you. And looking at comparing the folks who are performing on-site evaluation of adequacy, I can tell you that in comparison, again, other this same group of radiologists who are not using on-site evaluation, they have a higher rate of insufficient, diagnose, uh, insufficient tissue for diagnosis uh, biopsies compared to all the other groups. I'm just recapitulating the fact that that group is not providing the best tissue. And then I thought it was interesting to compare all of the diagnoses of insufficient tissue to diagnose and all the other diagnoses that I could provide a diagnosis. And I can tell you that as you increase the amount of tissue provided, uh, it, it, the, 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 the diagnoses of insufficient diagnosis uh, have less tissue compared to when we can provide a diagnosis, which is no surprise either. And when we looked at those two groups, whether you can provide diagnosis or not, there's no difference in age, sex, and other clinical or other data points. Then I want to look at complication rates. This is, think about it. Maybe, and this is just something to just think about. If if, if you've got an annoying pathologist bugging the nephrologist, give me more tissue, give me more tissue. Maybe as we keep bugging them, they would have more complications. Maybe I don't know. I thought it was something to look into. Maybe. So uh, now I should point out that this is limited to in-house hennepin cases because I don't have uh, um, follow-through clinical data on how access to EPIC for Southdale, or not Southdale, but like other hospital systems that we collect tissue from. So this is limited to just our in-house cases. Uh, complications are defined in incidents where the patients required uh, admission or uh, extension of inpatient hospitalization. So we only had 173 total cases, in-house cases, 14 of which had complications, which came at a rate of about 8%, which is kind of high, actually. Typically, we would expect the rate of complications for renal biopsies to be around 2%. So, I don't know what's going on, but they have a, kind of a higher rate of complications there. In terms of what kind of complications were encountered, it went anywhere from a perinephic hematoma, which is the most common complication to see in renal biopsy, after renal biopsy, to uh, gross hematuria, urinary retention, or worsening in the end. And if we look, again, I don't have the same groups to compare because, again, these are in-house cases. We had only so many different types of biopsy scenarios to compare. So we have uh, the setting of a radiologist using ultrasound and an 18-gauge needle with a renal pathologist providing an on-site evaluation. 
We have radiologists using CT with a renal pathologist providing on-site evaluation. We have nephrologists doing a biopsy, and they're doing their own interpretation. And in this setting, I couldn't come to any, uh, I mean, I couldn't find any difference between these groups. I don't think even if I increase my N that I would find a difference in the groups, but, you know, this lack of determining or resolving any differences could be secondary to my cohort size. I don't think so. But, um, then when I compared the cases that had complications to all the cases that didn't have complications, I didn't see any difference in uh, you know, the uh, sex, Asian patients, and these other lab parameters. So then I want to look at allograft kidney biopsy adequacy because we have a small population, not a high population. I'll preface that, that I don't have statistical power here with my analysis of this data or for most of the data. Uh, but I still want to present the data, present our numbers from the cohort, nonetheless. And again, just to remind you guys, um, the BAMP criteria does set forth what is an adequate, or marginally adequate, or an inadequate biopsy. So, looking at the angle from the biopsy performer, um, it, you can sort of see a suggestion that these cowboys, again, who are not using on-site evaluation, they're using 18 gauge needles that their rate of inadequate is about, you know, is gonna be higher than the rest. And if I had more data, I'm sure that would resolve itself and we would see that that group is providing, we already know they provide poor tissue, I'm pretty sure they're providing more, a uh, higher rate of inadequate uh, biopsies, transplant biopsies. And when we look at the angle of the performers of uh, who's performing the onsite evaluation, again, I'm pretty sure that the rate of inadequate is pretty low in comparison to these guys here that have a higher rate. But unfortunately, our, our N is not high enough and unfortunately, like even if I collected data from the U, there's only so many different var variations of who's collecting biopsies and perform adequacy, so it wouldn't really add much to my data. Uh, and so I want to look a little closer, and so I kind of looked at the groups as uh, all the cases, transplant cases in which I had, that were inadequate, and I could lump together the ones that had marginal or were adequate biopsies. I want to see if there are any differences between those groups of patients or those biopsies. And while there's no difference in age of the patients or serum creatinine, albumin, or protein creatinine ratio, there's a disproportionate representation of women in the group that had uh, inadequate biopsies, uh, a quite significant difference. And, and even though I have a low N for my transplant cohort, I'm not sure how to rationalize this. And if you look anatomically, for those of you who don't know, I'm sure most of you in here know this, a transplant kidney is placed in, in the pelvis. And so usually they're pretty superficial. This is just a CT scan showing uh, you know, uh, where the kidney is located. It's pretty superficial. You just have some oblique or transverse musculature and you can biopsy relatively easy. And there's no real anatomic considerations that are specific for female anatomy as opposed to male anatomy when they place these kidneys in the transplant recipients. So it's not really clear to me why a female patient would have a higher rate of inadequate biopsies, for instance, as, as a male patient. Any ideas? Have you, have you ever thought about that? I've never seen anything like this in literature. I don't know how strong. I'd say the primary bullet would be BMI. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately. So just talking about limitations of the study in general, as a referral center, I'm lacking a lot of clinical data. So as I showed you, I could only talk about the complications of about 100-something mm -hmm. patients as opposed to you know, the full 636 patients I had in my cohort. Um, I had a limited number of transplant patients, so I can't really speak confidently about any of that data, uh, generally. Uh, we didn't evaluate pediatric patients. We don't see pediatric patients, and no one's looked at adequacy of kidney biopsies in pediatric patients. And I thought about looking at maybe, maybe pediatric biopsies done here at the U, but again, there's not a lot of variability in terms of practitioners of who are doing the biopsies and who's doing on-site evaluation. It would not make for a really interesting study. And what's going to be more interesting is, is down the road, uh, as pathologists are maybe deferring such work as on-site evaluation to other team members, um, you know, as I mentioned, at the U, we have our pathology assistants performing on-site evaluation of kidney biopsies. Um, I didn't want to include them in my study because, honestly, they're, they're up on the, on the curve going up in terms of their uh, efficiency and confidence in doing it. So for collecting data right now would be pointless. Um, and in some settings, uh, they, histotexts are being utilized to evaluate on-site uh, adequacy. So it'll be interesting to see, in comparison to other folks, if there's even a difference. Probably is not a difference. So in summary, um, it seems that in some settings, um, 
the on-site evaluation can improve yield of glomeruli, especially when we looked at those radiologists that use ultrasound guidance and 18-gauge needles. There seemed to be an improvement, if you want to say, of the collection of glomeruli if they used on-site evaluation. Um, it looked like, especially the group that used 16-gauge needles, that if they uh, used a larger needle and if they maybe collected some more tissue, they would actually improve the yield of glommed arteries. Um, the strength of, while there is a linear relationship between serum albumin and patient age, um, you know, again, the slope is not great, but there is a strong uh, relationship between those parameters, variables. Mm -hmm. Uh, as I mentioned, just to just highlight again this group that's not using on site evaluation um, and using 18 gauge needles and ultrasound guidance, they're just providing a higher rate of insufficient tissue diagnoses and poor tissue in general. So uh, I think, in terms of practice change, that kind of operation shouldn't exist. I think we should have some sort of, those guys should be getting help in some fashion, whether pathologists in those institutions are coming to help them out or they train the radiologist to just spend two seconds and wheel around in their chair and go on the uh, pull, put the tissue under a dissected scope, or there's radiology technici technicians you can train to just evaluate on the tissue. This, they just need to do something because this is just performing time and time again, but performing worse. Um, it seems that the rate of insufficient tissue diagnosis decreases as you collect more tissue, which, which seems intuitive. Um, the nephrologists we saw are collecting less tissue, whether they're providing interpretation or they're doing the biopsy themselves. But the complication rates are not different compared to the group, so maybe they could collect more tissue if their, if their performance is the same as those other groups, they could collect more tissue and foreseeably they wouldn't have a higher complication rate. They don't have to be so wary of not collecting tissue, I guess I'm trying to say. Uh, our transplant patient cohort is small, but I still think that this, this rate, this disproportionate uh, 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 Seeing a higher rate of women with inadequate diagnosis is kind of odd. I'm not sure how to rationalize that. Any questions? That's really the end of that study that I was doing. Yeah, Dr. Santek. I'm sorry, I walked in a few minutes later. Yeah. Did you look at the, the 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 study that was done on the person that did the biopsy? Because if I know from other procedures like parasympathesis, all that, it's the experience of the biopsy of the person doing yeah. the procedure. Yeah. So. So here we have trainees put the needle in. Did you look at that? I didn't compare those groups. Uh, by far and away, uh, uh, most of those institutions don't have trainees rotating. The only one would be would. only one would be Hennepin. And in those instances, they have fellows sometimes doing the biopsies and sometimes not. That would be the only group, but that's a small proportion out of all the cases in the study. Here we don't have trainees arguing. No, no, that, that's uh, I'm not, I didn't do the studies. Not from here. This is from oh. Hennepin County. Hennepin. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So this study was based at Hennepin County. So, um, and, but that's a referral center for kidney biopsies. So most of their biopsies are coming from places like St. Cloud or, uh, for, you know, different places in the community that don't have trainees. So the trainee thing is not, wasn't evaluated. Yeah. And it had minimal effect. Aksa? Uh, my group of the qualifications, I was going from Justice Kimmel, but was there any relationship uh, with the length of the core with the rate of the complications? Uh, gee, you know, I don't think I looked at that. I'm not sure. Just yeah, no, no, that's a good point. Yeah, I didn't think about that. No, no, I didn't. And also, like, um, so apparently, it is that if you use the 16 gauge and you even don't have the on site evaluation, you are getting sufficient material. Sufficient material and decent quality tissue, because I showed also the glomerular density was equivalent. So they're shooting blindly, but they're hitting what they need to hit. But as you, as you do not have access. I don't have, I cannot speak so about that. Of, uh, taking, of course. Yeah, I can't speak about that because I don't know that. Th those, the people who are using 16 gauge needles were not from in house, so I, I don't have mm -hmm. that follow up data on those guys. But yeah, you're right, it would have been interesting to compare that. Dr. Crossan? Uh, Vero, that was a really interesting uh, study, and, and your evaluation of the data is really uh, extremely good. I appreciate that. And it actually confirms what I thought all the years that I was doing renal biopsies. I just wanted to make a comment that yeah. uh, when I started doing renal biopsies, we didn't have ultrasound and we didn't have CT. And so the nephrologist would come into the room with an uh, uh, x-ray of the abdomen 
you throw the x-ray up on the window, tape it up on the window, and use the x-ray to evaluate where the kidney was. And I was thinking that I probably should have studied the differences between sunny days and cloudy days. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't make that. <laughs> that would be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> So that part of the talk's over. I don't have an R01 grant, I don't have a lab, but everyone who comes here and gives a grand round talk talks about, well, what else they've done in their, in their lifetime or what they've done in their lab, et cetera, et cetera. So I will talk about what other academic endeavors I've done in the last two and a half, no, nah, three and a half years. So I think it's worthwhile boasting a little bit and sometimes also you guys seeing what kind of product you're putting out. So in terms of investigations, proper studies I've been involved in, uh, involved with Dr. Movahedi at Abbott, we put together the largest series of uh, disseminated peritoneal Lyme myomatosis and follow those patients. So you hear in the news about women who undergo laparoscopic morselation procedures in the uterus for uh, presumed fibroids. They go in there, they just chop up stuff, things are flying everywhere. They don't necessarily use endocatch bags. And uh, you know the horror story is that there's like a, a Lyme sarcoma in there and it's just been disseminated. And so that's what's in, hot in the news, but no one's ever looked at, well, what about the benign myoma that gets scattered throughout the peritoneum? Well, those guys can form a little nest somewhere and grow later on down the road. And so we just described those patients and I think it was worthwhile. No OBGY, o, no OBGYN journal wanted to take it. We, we sort of got, I mean, I don't know why Mova Hedy was so gung-ho about submitting it to a gynae journal. We eventually submit to the first, I decided to send it to this one in Europe and they took it off the bat. I mean, they didn't hesitate, it's a pathology journal. But <clears throat> and then with Dr. Stewart, Amin, and Scott, we put together this largest series of this very odd entity of uh, pancreatic adenocarcinoma. It's an osteoclast -like variant, and we really focused on the, the cytologic features because those haven't really been highly emphasized. And it's not just a cute thing of saying how these cells look on pap smear or how they look on Difquick, but uh, in a practical sense, these patients are often diagnosed and management is provided after the FNA. So if you can describe and appreciate the morphology from the FNA, uh, which is quite distinctive in this entity, then the patient can be managed the appropriate way. So it was kind of a cute project. And these are things that are published. I'm not going to talk about things that are not published or stuff like that. Uh, case reports. This is just a cute little case report in which a, 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 a woman presented in which she had presumed peritoneal carcinomatosis. Imaging said, hey, I've, I've got peritoneal, carcin uh, peritoneal carcinomatosis after a section. Uh, it was determined she had a, a low-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasm, and she also had, a, a, at the same time, a serous carcinoma which has never been shown that these patients have had uh, a serous carcinoma of any type, and uh, this mucinous neoplasm has never been shown to happen at the same time. So just to keep your mind open as an OBGYN that you, know, you could see two first. And this is just a cute thing. We know we do frozens all the time in ovarian, ovarian masses we get in the gross room, and uh, in this instance, it was just your banal run-of-the-mill ovarian serous uh, adenofibroma, but there were these little sex cord stroma elements that could throw you off maybe if you were looking at that on a frozen in the end, it was just this benign, two benign things going on at once. And then, for the first time ever, we described IgG4-related disease, the ovary. If I lived 50, 60 years ago, this would have been, at the, uh, my, my name would have been on, been put on this. You know, we have Rydal's thyroiditis, we have Oman's disease and retroperitoneum, so this could have been named Seculich Mulvahedi disease. <laughs> or just Seculich disease, there's other ways, there's a mouthful. So. Well, we have Furman grade from here, we have yeah. Gleason score, I mean, hey, come on, guys, sell it. It's, 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 Seculich disease of the ovary from the renal pathologist. Uh, and then we described, this was a very interesting case report. This was BK, so uh, you all know, or you've heard that BK, vir B BK polyomavirus can cause a uh, inflammation and infection of, of the transplanted kidney. Uh, what you may not also know is that BK virus is, uh, can drive neoplasia in, in the urothelium. So uh, they have shown association with BK virus and urothelial carcinomas of, of some site, of some types, and they've shown that we also, most of us, we have seropositivity up to 90% of, of BK virus, so we often have BK virus in our lower urinary tract in the urothelium, and, and when we become immunosuppressed, uh, that, that virus can sort of ascend and cause BK nephropathy. And so what was cute here is that we showed the in-between lesion. We showed the hyperplasia and the dysplasia. So we know about the far end spectrum of BK virus causing frank carcinoma. We know that it can lay dormant and kind of smolder in the urothelium, but we never saw the in-between lesion of hyperplasia. It's a spectrum, right? Neoplasia is a spectrum. You have frank malignancy invasion, we have hyperplasia and in-situ lesion. This was the in-situ lesion. So it was kind of a nice connected dot sort of case report. 
you know, people say they poo-poo case reports and say, hey, it's a waste of your time. But I think if you have a significant case report, uh, that has value. Uh, on top of that, if you ask, um, there, there's a world-famous uh, nephrologist in Glenn Blank now who described membranous nephropathy back in the 60s, 50s. It starts with the G, the guy from UCLA. Anyway, he talks about his case report where he described membranous nephropathy for the first time as the highest cited paper he has in his career. And this guy's published hundreds and hundreds of papers. He's well-respected. He writes in Brenner's kidney. Um, I'll go in my blank. Anyway, the point is case reports, if they're good and valuable, they can be worthwhile. And then we describe for the first time utilizing... Uh, so nodular fasciitis can be seen anywhere. Um, and, and relatively recently, it's been associated to have this USP6 gene rearrangement. So back about two, three years ago, the Mayo Clinic put out the largest series sort of validating the examination of the USP6 gene rearrangement in uh, nodular fasciitis. And so this case report was essentially the first or second uh, non-male report the use of USP6 gene rearrangement nodular fasciitis. So sort of validating its, its utility. And this was a cute report I did with Dr. Linden and, 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 uh, and in, in which we saw the kidney involved with uh, a mantle cell lymphoma. And it's not just mantle cell lymphoma involved in the kidney because patients, end-stage lymphoma patients that have uh, who die of lymphoma in autopsy studies, 40% of them have kidney involvement. What was cute here was that you had uh, direct parenchymal involvement and destruction of tissue, but it was elaborating antibodies were causing a member of a proliferative lesion. So it was a two-pronged attack on the kidney with this lymphoma, which was novel or interesting. And then I've written some review papers you can read on your own time. So in terms of future topics of investigation, uh, I've always been interested in podocytes. They have a very, they have a vital role in the glomerular filtration apparatus. And, uh, you know, often when they are perturbed, uh, the filter doesn't work. And often the function and the architecture of the podocyte, they're, they're directly connected, and often the cytoskeleton is key in all that. So I, if I have time for the lab, I would like to maybe look at the cytoskeleton and podocytes a little bit more. I think fibrillary, fibrillary GM would be something interesting to study. In the series from uh, Sami Nasser and Mayo, he's shown that a good number of those patients uh, do just fine, often without even medical treatment. And so it's one of the odd glomerular nephritides that these patients do quite well afterwards. And I think it deserves further understanding as to why those patients do so well, as opposed to other GNs that we look at in practice. And then more recently, I'll be studying renal fibrosis, and I want to see what drives it, what are possible targets and way to intervene. Renal fibrosis, we see, is end-stage result of most kidney diseases. I'd be interested to study that a little bit more. I should definitely acknowledge a number of folks. I have to acknowledge Dr. Crary, who, from as a first-year resident, uh, introduced me to renal pathology, and through the years has kept me interested, and I'm not changing that line of interest. I have to thank the department from day one. I've gotten everything I've wanted out of this experience as a resident. Uh, I couldn't have asked for more. And I have to thank my wife because she's put up with me. <laughs> um, no, I mean, she, she sacrificed a lot by coming to the U.S. I know people think, well, coming to the U.S. must be magical. But, uh, you know, there's, there's other places, next, especially the next four years, that could be better places. Uh, she, you know, if we had stayed in Europe, we stayed in Germany, went to Switzerland, she would be practicing medicine right now, not fumbling along, and I'll be the one trying to learn German or sharpen up with my German. So, anyway, I'm done. Do you have any questions? I'll take them. Yes, Dr. Hey, I got a phone call, but I, I think the question about this albumin relationship, looking at that. Figure, it looked like there were like two points. Yeah. That if you took those two, it points, doesn't make a difference. It was like probably no relation. No, I took. I I know. I don't like taking out points in my data ever. I've worked enough labs to know people do that, and I don't like doing it. But I do it just for statistical but funsies. Those albumins were so high. I took those. Yeah. Well, you you asked. I, mean, I took those. Long long long. Yeah. It didn't make a difference. I mean, I wonder if there, there's something wrong with those two points. I've never seen albumin. I don't like taking out my data. And you should wait, you wait for linear regression. Do I wait for linear regression? What do you mean by that? Just for those points being so far out of the curve. They're, they're just for us, probably those more, but. Yeah, I don't know. But when I took them out, they didn't make a difference. There's still the significance there, so. And how did you get out of those eight? Maybe they were point eight. No, I, I looked. <laughs> 
<laughs> Regardless, I mean, I could care less because when I take him out, it doesn't make a difference. So, so. That's it. All right. Thank you. <laughs>